Network, and today we are going to be talking about food wars, the ongoing battle over your food, not only over what you put in your food and what, what you put in your body and how that's going to affect your health, but the war over food sovereignty, the ability to grow your own food, the ability to choose your own food, the ability to uh, trade food with other people. All these kinds of things have been under attack for a number of years now. And collectively, we could call this the food wars. And we're going to get into some history. We're going to talk about, I have three different main stories here relating to food in different ways. And it also connects to the climate change issue, the climate change agenda as well. And we're going to get into some of that history. So, uh, Stay with me. But first of all, I want to remind you guys to go to my website, theconsciousresistance.com, theconsciousresistance.com. Guys, this is the place for all of my content that I've been producing over the last 10 years now, including a brand new interview in English and Spanish with longtime researcher Daniel Estelin. He interviewed me for his channel. And one of the news reports that we're going to cover tonight is a recent one about mRNA technology in animals and in food. You can find all that at theconsciousresistance.com, including my books, my documentaries. You can support us by buying shirts like our Exit and Build shirt here. You can uh, donate to us on our invest page via crypto. We have a P.O. box. So many other ways to support my work if you want to continue to do that, including by supporting me on Substack and on Buy Me a Coffee. Uh, and I'll mention one other thing. We are beginning to take advertisers now. We're going to be working with independent advertisers like yourself, not big box stores, of course, or big corporations, but anybody out there who has a, co uh, a company, a service, an entrepreneur, reach out to us, click that uh, on the front page. Now you'll see, you click that and it opens up and tells you all about the details and we'll be in touch very soon to see if we can collaborate together. So first off, let's start with this one. This one's a little bit more uh, climate oriented, but it relates to food. And this was a couple of weeks ago and I honestly haven't seen anybody else talk about this yet. Mayor Adams of New York City, this is from the New York City government website right here, commits to reducing city's food-based emissions by 33%. Hmm, that number 33 sure pops up a lot. Huh, very curious. I'll have to do a video on that very soon. Uh, by 33% by 2030 after releasing new greenhouse gas emissions inventory incorporating emissions from food. So what the heck does that mean? This means that literally the city of New York and the governor, they're trying to get up not only in like what commercial and private businesses uh, do as far as their food waste, but they're talking about private food waste. That means they're, they might be tracking, they're not doing it at the moment, but they soon might be tracking individual New, York, New Yorkers' uh, food waste. Now that sounds pretty difficult. There's millions and millions of people in New York be hard to really estimate that, but you could imagine as we move towards digital identities and carbon trackers that this could come into uh, fruition. So we have the press conference. You can see it. This was April 17th. And yeah, it's basically, as it says there in the headline, they're talking about food emissions. So Mayor Eric Adams and his climate officer released their first integrated greenhouse gas inventory, which incorporates emissions from the production and consumption of food. Those emissions represent 20% of New York's overall emissions, the third largest source behind buildings and transportation. Uh, so basically, they're saying that they're now going to start tracking food waste, and they also announced the city will reduce absolute carbon emissions from food purchases across its city agencies by 33% by 2030. So again, it's focused on food purchases across its city agencies, they're going to reduce absolute carbon emissions. What does that mean? That could mean that the New York City, uh, all their agencies, government agencies are going to go vegan or vegetarian or something like that because that's the claim that it will at least reduce emissions. I'm not here to argue in favor of that one way or the other, even though I am a vegan. Um, and I don't support government doing these kinds of things as well and using tax dollars to do this. New York City is, this is what the mayor says, New York City is leading the world when it comes to combating climate change because we're using every option on the menu in our fight. Oh, nice food pun. And that includes changing our menus too. This new emissions report shows us that plant-powered food isn't just good for our physical and mental health, but good for the planet as well. And so he says, by leading with, we're going to make strides, we've already made strides by leading with plant-based meals in our public hospitals and introducing plant-powered Fridays in our public schools. Now we need to go further. And look, honestly, I don't think that's the worst thing. I wouldn't like it to be taxpayer funded, but putting the option at least for plant-based meals, and let's just be honest, guys, hospitals, which are supposed to be a place, at least ostensibly, that are there to take care of your health, 
are some of the worst places to be. You go to hospitals and there's like Subway, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, everywhere. There's no good organic food at a freaking hospital. You would imagine they would have the cleanest, finest food so that people who are in hospitals recovering could eat healthy. And that would include plant-based options. But that's not what's on here. So I wouldn't even estimate just because, because the thing is just because something's plant-based doesn't mean it's healthy. Don't make that assumption. And they want us to make that assumption. And it also says that, quote, we're committing to reducing the food emissions by 2030 and we're challenging our private sector partners to join us by cutting their food emissions by 25% in the same period. So this is just a challenge to the private sector. There's no government coming in saying, look, we're going to take over and force businesses to reduce by 25% or face fines. So just to make it clear, they're also not saying they're going to judge like individuals, houses, but let's just search the word household real quick and see what pops up. Uh, where did it go? New York City has measured citywide emissions since 2005, but this is the first time the city has included emissions from household consumptions. These emissions were modeled by Eco Data Lab as part of an ongoing project coordinated by the C40. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. The C40 uh, mayors. Let me see where that's at. C40 and American Express. Uh, but the C40 Mayors is just another one of these organizations. You probably haven't heard of it. The 40 largest cities with mayors come together in the United States, and they are funded by the Rockefellers and the Gates Foundation and all those fun people. So it says this is coordinated by Eco Data Lab as part of the C40, working with cities to identify urban consumption indicators for data-driven climate action and measurement. This new inventory shows that 20% of New York greenhouse gas comes from household food consumption, primarily from meats, poultry, fish, eggs, and dairy products. This means New Yorkers can significantly reduce the city emissions by eating more low-carbon food, fruit, vegetables, grains, and legumes. Uh, again, like if done voluntarily, I don't have a problem with this, but this is just one more dangerous step in that direction. The fact that they're even mentioning households, and they're talking about what households are um, allegedly emitting and how that 20% of New York's overall emissions allegedly comes from household consumption by mainly meat. Clearly, you can see it's going to go in that direction, guys. They're going to push in that direction uh, sooner or later. So let's see here. It says, in particular, New York City hospitals are leading the way, serving plant-based meals as the default option. So that's kind of messed up, too. It's the default option. So maybe you have to ask for meat if you want meat now in a New York City hospital. Uh, it's on track to serve 850,000 plant-based meals, reducing its carbon emission. And they introduced plant-powered Fridays in public schools last year, emphasizing the central role that healthy meals... Okay, so they're trying to get in the kids' heads, of course. But I would really want to know, like, what is on those plates? What do they consider plant-powered uh, Fridays or plant-based in the thing? I mean, that doesn't mean it's good food in any way. It could be soy. More than likely, it probably is soy-based, GMO, pesticide-laden stuff. That's what they consider. So we have to do more than just go just beyond plant powered and into plant based and into actually healthy and organic. But at the same time, again, I am a vegan voluntarist. That means I don't believe that there should be forced violence or coercion to achieve the goals I believe in. That means I want a world where all relationships are voluntary and consensual. And even though I don't want to see animals harmed. I also don't think we should use the force of government. I don't think it's it's morally right to use the force of government to try to compel, coerce, tax, or use violence against people to make them become vegetarian or vegan. And so this goes on. This is the New York City Greenhouse Gas Inventories website on the New York City website. You can see they're tracking citywide emissions, uh, integrated city consumption. There's no tracker of household emissions at the moment. But you could see it based on the way they're communicating. You could see this eventually, because right now this is just tracking the city's emissions, city government done through them, right? So that's, what, that's all they have control over. That's what they start with is what they have most easy control. But you could see this switching eventually and then combined with some sort of app to a carbon tracking, emission tracking app that New Yorkers are voluntarily allowed to participate and then eventually forced to participate in. Here's more reports. New York City will target food choices in its battle against uh, climate change. That was reported at Gothamist. So this is all just in the last couple weeks. And again, this comes from the C40 cities, c40.org. For those who haven't looked into this, I've written about this as well because I'm from Houston and Houston's Mayor Sylvester Turner, who works sits on the Resilient Foundation, which is funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. 
is part of this C40 city's mayor. So if you live in a major city in the U.S., more than likely your mayor is a part of this and is signed on. And it's all just Agenda 2030. Uh, they talk about the planetary healthy diet, ideally sourced from organic agriculture. At least this one acknowledges that. But I don't see any of the other ones acknowledging it. And you can see you got C40 mayors here, signatory cities from Seoul, Stockholm, Tokyo, Toronto, Paris, Oslo, Barcelona, Copenhagen, Guadalajara, all over the place, right? So... Just to show you more about that, I encourage you to look into C40 and to see this is how it works, though. Is And I've talked about this, too. You get globalist organizations like the World Economic Forum, like the United Nations. They put out policy papers or they have think tanks that say, hey, we wish that the world would do this. And then the uh, politicians and the media who are attending those meetings, they start to repeat those same talking points. And then you see it work its way down from the international multilateral level like that, global governance level, down to the local level where you have mayors in their cities and towns calling for the same things. And it ripples all the way down. Now, this next story here comes from Children's Health Defense, The Defender, was published again a few weeks ago. And it's actually originally from Dr. Mercola, re-aggregated re by um, the Defender of Children's Health Defense. And we're not going to read the whole thing, but this topic is becoming more uh, prominent, I think, right now. Big agriculture panicking over bill to require labeling of gene-altering products. Missouri bill, House Bill 1169 would require labeling of products that can alter your genes. Big agricultural lobbyists strongly oppose it because it would mean labeling livestock injected with mRNA vaccines. So at a glance, pork producers have been using customizable mRNA-based, quote, vaccines on their herds since 2018 without telling the public. I know some of you have seen those stories. It's pretty crazy. All customized mRNA vaccine, vaccines are untested. Only the mRNA platform itself has been approved, approved. And according to the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, quote, there are no current mRNA vaccines licensed for use in beef cattle in the U.S. However, a lobbyist for the association claims to have, quote, double vaccinated his own herd with an mRNA vaccine against bovine respiratory disease. You can also find Iowa, Iowa State University began trialing an mRNA vaccine against bovine respiratory syncytial virus on October 1st, 2021. And again, in Missouri House Bill 1169 is requiring labeling of these products and it's being opposed by big agriculture. And this story, it, again, it's written by Dr. Mercola, but it relates to this gentleman who I've, I've heard about recently. I don't know much about his work, but he seems to be doing good work. Attorney Tom Renz, Thomas Renz, he is one of the people promoting and leading the way of this legislation in Missouri, the House Bill 1169, which apparently he helped write. And in an April 1st tweet, he stated, breaking news, the lobbyists for the cattlemen and pork associations in several states have confirmed they will be using mRNA vaccines in pigs and cows this month. Wow. We must support Missouri HB 1169. Uh, it is literally the only chance we have to present this, prevent this. No one knows the impacts of doing this, but we are all potentially facing the risk of, quote, being a died suddenly if we don't stop this. And Dr. Mercola gets into how altering the food is part of the transhumanist agenda and focused on food. This is something that I've covered as well as I've written about um, biosynthetics and the bioeconomy that, that Biden was investing to in last year. And all of that is just part of the bigger transhumanist agenda, trying to get us into uh, gene altering technology, gene editing, editing technology, altering the food gene, you know, obviously genetically modified. Then you get genetically edited foods. Uh, and this is just part of that overall agenda. And this, of course, ties into the World Economic Forum, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, everything that we've seen uh, Klaus Schwab talk about. So I'll be putting this article in all the articles in the link if you want to dive in and read the full thing. But I want to show you another one that's actually on our website, theconsciousresistance.com. States consider legislation to restrict use of mRNA technology in livestock. And this is coming from our webmaster and contributor, Neil Rademacher. Shout out to Neil. Uh, he basically just gathered a list of, you know, we just mentioned the one in Missouri, but he gathered a list of the various bills, at least the ones that we could find right now, that are uh, bills in different states that are working to also restrict or ban mRNA technology and gene therapies and animals, livestock, and demand full disclosure to consumers on the packaging of such food. These states include North Dakota, Tennessee, Arizona, Idaho, and Missouri at the moment. And he does a list of that names the bill and then gives you a list of what it actually is trying to do and there's some some more information so i encourage you to check that out because that is just another part of it right like so if we can't get the quote-unquote 
vaccine in your arm in you know through scaring you with pandemics and panics then we'll put it in your food and i mean obviously no one knows what that's going to do but if you're not ready to eat genetically modified or genetically edited uh, engineered food why would you want to eat food that has been altered by gene therapies and i don't know it's just probably something that most of us want to stay away from now this next couple articles here as we start to wrap up and we're going to again end with getting into the history of these food wars and i'll talk to you guys about something i covered in the pyramid of power documentary series but these next two stories they come from cnn they're you know cnn so take them for what you will and you can maybe guess it why cnn is pushing this because we know cnn is a puppet for the mainstream narratives and yes as a vegan i know for sure they're trying to push veganism on people but it's not whole foods plant-based like organic diet it's bill gates burgers heavily processed genetically engineered 3d printed food eat and eat pro, uh, bugs eat your own feces etc all that kind of crazy stuff but what i want to show you guys is these next couple stories are interesting to me because for one, they're technically not vegan, right? So this isn't a vegan, uh, you know, this is an argument for, for veganism. This is actually about these types of new technologies, which again, you could file under the gene editing or uh, cell, it's more like cell cultures. So they take a, the culture of like, say a chicken, they take a real chicken, it starts with a real animal. So again, this is why it's not vegan. And perhaps they um, take some of those chicken cells, put it in a dish and they start replicating it and they create in a lab a chicken breast, right? So it came from an original animal source, has animal cells in it, and it has been cultured and grown in the lab. And who knows, would you notice the difference? I don't know, I don't eat meat anymore, but I guess you probably wouldn't if it was really coming from, like just on the, the most basic biological level. I mean, if it's a cell, it's a cell, it's a cell, right? So if it's a chicken cell, whether it's a chicken cell created by God or a chicken cell created by man in a lab, would we know the difference? Is there a difference? I don't know, but I wanna start this conversation with you guys because it, it takes me some interesting places. Let's just read these headlines. This first one says, eating meat without slaughtering animals may be our future. The second one is called Meatballs Made with Mammoth DNA Created by Australian Food Startup. And this is just crazy. Like, again, this is meatballs made by some old school DNA from thousands and thousands of years ago. Uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe. I don't depending on how old this sample is. It says woolly mammoth remains with fur and tissue still intact are regularly found entombed in Arctic permafrost. Their discovery has allowed scientists to sequence the mammoth genome and learn intriguing details about the lives of these extinct Ice Age giants. Now, some of that information is being used to grow an approximation of mammoth meat in a lab. Again, they say an approximation. Vow, which is an Amer- uh, Australian cultured meat startup, has made what it describes as a mammoth meatball. The project's goal, according to the company, is to draw attention to the potential of cultured meat to make eating habits more planet-friendly. On Tuesday, the meatball will join the collection at this Museum of Science and Medicine in the Netherlands. And the founder says, or the chief scientific officer says, we need to start rethinking how we get our food. My biggest hope for the project is that a lot more people across the world begin to hear about cultured meat. So they're using this from mammoth DNA. It says, even calling the creation mammoth meat is a bit of a stretch. It's more like lab-made lamb mingled with a tiny amount of mammoth DNA. So let's go ahead and find out what's really in this. Scientists working on the projects didn't have access to a frozen stash of mammoth tissue on which to base their efforts. Instead, they focused on a protein present in mammals called myoglobin that gives meat its texture, color, and taste. Identifying the DNA sequence for the mammoth version in a publicly available genome database. They filled in the gaps in the mammoth myoglobin DNA sequence using information from the genome of an African elephant. These scientists inserted the synthesized gene into a sheep muscle cell. So now this is getting kind of weird. So it's like they got a piece of DNA from a mammoth and then throw in some African elephant in there and then synthesize this into a sheep muscle cell, which was then cultured or grown in a lab. And eventually they're able to produce 400 grams of mammoth meat. And he says, uh, one of the professors, a uh, professor from Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotech at the University of Queensland says, quote, from a genomic point of view, it's only one gene amongst all the other sheep genes that is mammoth. It's one gene out of 25,000. So he's like, yeah, I don't believe the hype. Um, and so it goes on from there. And so again, it gets into the conversation of cultured versus the real thing. Advocates hope cultured meat will reduce the need to slaughter animals for food and, of course, help the f- fight the climate crisis. The food system is responsible for about one-third, okay, gas emissions, get out of that. 
Vox hopes to soon get regularly approval, regulatory approval in Singapore, the first country to approve cultured meat and to sell lab-made quail meat it has developed. In the U.S., the FDA has said that lab-grown chicken is okay for human consumption. Wow, I wonder if any of it's on the market, but the point is they've said it's okay. So that's one of them. Uh, alleged ma- meatballs from mammoth, which obviously is not really the case. This one goes on eating meat without slaughtering animals, maybe in the future, but it's kind of the same thing. Cultivated anim- uh, meat is real meat grown directly from animal cells, says the founder of C- and CEO of Upside Foods. These products are not vegan, vegetarian, or plant-based. They are real meat made without the animal. The process of making cultivated meat is similar to brewing beer, but instead of growing yeast or microbes, we grow animal cells. So he says they start by taking a small sample from a livestock such as cow or chicken, then identify the cells that can multiply. Quote, from there, we put these cells in a clean and controlled environment and feed them with essential nutrients to that they need to replicate naturally. In essence, we can recreate the conditions that naturally exist in an animal's bodies. Somebody says uh, it's meat without slaughter. And um, so, yeah, and there's a, a cultivated beef burger from Mosa Meat, a food technology company based in the Netherlands. So I'm curious. I'm not a meat eater, so I wouldn't be eating any of this either way. But what do you guys think about this? How do you feel about this? Do you think this is maybe a sort of, you know, like for one, I know a lot of my audience is skeptical of the claims about uh, emissions from our food and cow farts and this and that. And the reality is, of course, even plant based like almond milk or soy if you're doing monocropping it's still going to be uh taking up you know deforestation it's gonna still can be harmful to the climate so there's no guarantee that just because something's plant-based it's it's better right um that's why we need to use permaculture to grow our food and whether it's meat you know livestock or plants i prefer plants but do what you will so it's not just a black and white argument, right? But that's what they're claiming is that this will be one way to stop the climate crisis and get people away from eating meat. And, and that brings up to me an interesting question. I wonder, let's imagine, put aside your biases for a moment. Let's imagine that there is truth and that let's say that we found out there was a conclusive study that, that said eating meat is causing harm in the planet. And if we continue to eat meat, the planet will be dead within 100 years or that we won't be able to sustain human life or whatever. And again, let's forget the details for a moment. But just imagine that there was a study that we could all trust, multiple studies, a big study, the biggest study's ever done. It found conclusively, guys, we're going to die if we don't stop eating meat. Would you stop? Because I have a feeling because diet is so close to people's heart and, and being that even if we were presented with in, incontrovertible evidence and conclusive evidence showing This action we're taking, in this case, eating meat, but you could insert anything else like driving cars or um, anything, right? Like let's think in a reasonable world if we did have real hardcore scientific evidence. I know some of you are going to say, Derek, we already do. Others will say, no, that's nonsense. But let's say that we could agree on and we could conclude that there was real evidence that doing certain actions like eating meat or driving vehicles was going to cause harm to the planet. Would you stop voluntarily? I don't think most people would, and unfortunately, that would justify, at least in the minds of the tyrants, why they need to use authoritarianism, technocracy, top-down control to force people to do the quote-unquote right thing. So I just want you guys to think about that. I will check out the comments. I look forward to seeing what your thoughts are on that. But let's go to one final point before we wrap up here, and that is my Pyramid of Power documentary series, for those who have seen it, we've released three seasons so far, 12 episodes. Episode 13, season four, is coming very soon about the technocratic state. But if you go to season two and you look up our episode on food as a weapon, there's, for one, if you haven't watched this, please do watch this. I put a lot of effort and energy and research into this. But this just outlines the, how the current food paradigm is GMOs, it's pesticides, and the origin of that goes back to the Rockefellers and their... Uh, bringing pesticides, bringing unsustainable, destructive agricultural practices to the world and bringing GMOs through the first quote-unquote green revolution. So you had the green revolution that brought pesticides and monocropping. Then you got the quote-unquote gene revolution that brought GMOs. And now we're at what, like the gene therapy revolution or the next stage of it. And I go through in here just talking about the various examples of science being corrupted uh, at the EPA and other agencies, the FDA. But 
now this one part here, because I talked, I'm calling this video Food Wars, right? And if you followed my friend Christian Westbrook at Ice Age Farmer, then you know about the food wars that have gone on. But let me remind you, for those who haven't seen, that there's a 1974 memo drafted by former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, where he outlines this plan to potentially use food as a tool at the time they talk about for foreign policy, but you could imagine it being used against the domestic population as well, to try to uh, and basically to force their agenda down nations' throats. And he talked about the potential for using food as a weapon of war. It's called uh, NSSM 200, or National Security Study Memorandum 200, Implications of Worldwide Population Growth for U.S. Security and Overseas Interests. And it was drafted by Henry Kissinger and the National, U.S. National Security Council. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this. It says the memo focuses on the paramount importance to population control measures and the promotion of contraceptive measures to 13 populous nations. So they talk about using contraceptive measures to control nations, using USA, the USAID to use family planning uh, to try to force nations to do what they want. And it says, quote, take account of what steps a country is taking in population control as well as food production. The document also notes that it should be, it's important to, quote, avoid the appearance of coercion while also discussing that there's going to be uh, mandatory programs. And the document says, quote, is the U.S. prepared to accept food rationing to help people who can't or won't control their population growth? So they talk about using food and starving people or threatening people or withholding food as a way to try to force them to do population control through like abortion and, quote, unquote, family planning and things of that sort. And you can also go back. Uh, to 20, when was it? I think it was 2020, 2021. It was right whenever the COVID panic was going on. The Rockefeller Foundation announced the Reset the Table initiative, which was officially titled Reset the Table, Meeting the Moment to Transform the U.S. Food System. And you can see in their own language, guys, that they make it clear that the moment we are facing right now, that we've been facing the last couple of years with COVID-1984, and that what we're still dealing with, which has now shifted to focus on climate, that this is the moment to transform the food system. You know, when you talk about uh, the Great Reset, talking about resetting the economy, Klaus Schwab said we need to reset capitalism and that COVID-19 gave us that example. But then you have the World Economic Forum, you got Rockefeller Foundation and other groups calling for this is the moment to reset the food supply. This is the moment to push towards climate change. And if you haven't seen my latest article for The Last American Vagabond, it's a part of a series of articles that are going to be coming out in the coming days focused on the climate change narrative. This one's about how the Rockefeller Foundation's new focus on climate change signals the next phase of the Great Reset. I just fi finished a new article, which will be published maybe by tomorrow, about how the United Nations uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres is complaining that we're lagging behind on the uh, agenda 2030 and then at this rate we're only going to achieve 30 percent of our goals and we're only going to get one of the uh, one of the 17 sustainable development goals completed at the rate we're going we need the world to recommit to the climate change narrative and so they're going to host the united nations sustainable development goals summit in september in new york city of this year and i would love i'm thinking of organizing some sort of counter summit where maybe a couple of days we get together and we discuss the autonomous development goals, the alternative to the sustainable development goals that I present in my book, How to Opt Out the Technocratic State, and maybe even a counter protest so that the people of the world can see that we do not support this Agenda 2030. But we should take some solace in the fact that they're having to shift up their narratives. The COVID narrative is worn out. So we see that they're trying to use, they, they attempted and they did use the COVID narrative to we're going to reset the world, great reset, great uh, reset capitalism. The Rockefellers calling for resetting the food systems. And now the United Nations World Economic Forum and the Rockefellers all shifting their focus towards the climate change narrative as the way to achieve the change, right? COVID, they say, presented the opportunity. But now they're like, if we're going to fix the world and fight climate change, we got to reset all these other systems too. So I've shared a lot and I hope you guys follow along. I hope you go to theconsciousresistance.com and you get the links and you do the research for yourself. I would love to hear your thoughts about what you think about these stories, about the New York City starting to focus on food emissions, about the various bills and efforts to stop mRNA in animals, and your thoughts on diet and would you support eating animal meat that was cultured in a lab and not necessarily because of climate change per se but just because you know if, if it was better for the planet or if you just maybe even if it's just a, a way to eat animal product without 
killing animals. I don't know. I want to hear your thoughts, though, and I appreciate everybody who shares uh, their thoughts. I will watch the comments and, uh, and get back to you. That's it for now, guys. Thank you so much for the support. Remember, theconsciousresistance.com is my website. Check out theconsciousresistance.com slash invest. If you can donate, we got a P.O. box there listed. You can send checks. You can send cash. You can send equipment. If you don't use it, I'll put it to use. And you can sign up on Buy Me a Coffee. You can support me on Substack. And at the very least, guys, please share this content. It really does mean a lot to me. Thank you so much. Until next time, remember, you are powerful, you are beautiful, and you are free, my friends. Peace. Since 2012, the Conscious Resistance Network has been an independent media organization focused on empowering individuals through education, philosophy, health, and community organizing. We work to create a world where corporate and state power do not rule over the lives of free human beings. Our motto is leading by example and helping others in their pursuit of freedom. Visit theconsciousresistance.com to find our articles, documentaries, interviews, podcasts, books, and more. Remember, you are powerful, you are beautiful, and you are free.